Chris Camillo was once known as the guy who turned 20,000 into $2 million, and then 2 million into 10, but this year, he's really up to stakes. He has more than doubled, nearly tripled his net worth in less than a year. All three of us have done well in 2020. I'm closing in on doubling my account this year too, but Chris has played the stock market in 2020 unlike anything I've ever seen. He is an absolute beast. You know what they say about risk and reward? Well, at least so far, his big risks have paid off. Today on Dumb Money, how much is enough? How much margin is too much? The extreme $18 million margin loan that he's taken out could actually destroy his financial well being. Or if he's right, it could secure his family's financial security for generations to come. Today, we'll find out why he did it, what exactly he's doing with the money, and most importantly, why he is confident enough in his stock trades to risk it all. This is Dumb Money Live with Chris Camillo, Dave Hansen, and Jordan McLean, streaming live on YouTube. We are Dumb Money. Hey there, Dave here along with Chris and Jordan. We are Dumb Money. Welcome to the show. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe. It's not always an $18 million day, but we are always doing something interesting every single day. And if you like what we're doing, there's a little thumbs up button right there. Go for it. Use it for good. Uh, so let's get into this crazy $18 million margin loan. And we do say this all the time, but I think today is a perfect example of why we always say we do not know your risk tolerance, that our risk tolerance is very different than most people. Chris's risk tolerance is insane. We're not financial advisors. Do not do what we do. These are, uh, these are shows to help you learn from the way we think, but you should never try to copy our trades. Chris, We've, we've been friends since we were teenagers. I know you've always been a bit of a risk taker. Those early days investing, it was much smaller amounts, um, but it was not uncommon for you to put all of your money into a single stock trade back then, right? Yeah, Dave, do you remember, I, I think this is an important opportunity for us to talk about just the concept of borrowing money for investing in general on a much larger scope. Do you remember out in LA, we've talked about this story a couple of times, I yep. was I thought I had what a sure thing, an investment that was a sure thing, right? And I had actually took out cash advances on every single credit card I had, maxed out every credit card, cash advances. Then I took those cash advances, put them in a brokerage account, and then I margin, full margin, um uh to buy this stock, right? And then also bought some options. So it was a, basically margin on top of cash advances, which is the riskiest thing a person could ever do. Well, as you know, Dave, uh, that stock ended up being a fraudulent company and probably is part of the reason why we spend so much time talking about ethics on this channel, why we have so much anger uh, at companies that we perceive to be doing things that are not appropriate in the market and pushing the ethical boundaries uh, that, you know, it all comes, you know, they say everything comes from your childhood. Well, we, we were like 20, 21, 22, I don't know, years old when this happened, but that was a big deal. Lost it all, Dave, lost a hundred percent of it. And that put me in debt um, for how many years? Seven, eight, nine years, I think, right? A long time. And yeah, the, and the fact that that was credit card money and not even your own money, that was, I think that's kind of why now, even though you do take bigger risks than anyone that I know, you're you're thoughtful about it and you're even more calculating about the way you you know you you take that risk reward and really look at it as as you know like you don't want to get into that situation again where you have to work for eight years just to get back to zero. Yeah, I, and I think you can't have a conversation about risk and margin unless you first have a conversation about um, kind of risk, bucketing risk assets, right? And that's a conversation me and Jordan were having even before the show. We were like, yeah, we make these trades. The first thing we think of is our family, you know? So it's like, how can you bucket, uh, how do we bucket, how do I bucket my risk assets to think about them separate from the money I think about that is geared towards my kids' college education and paying my mortgage and going on family vacations and, you know, just all the things, paying the bills and retirement, right? All those things. I, I think the most important thing to do is for a person to figure out how to, how to bucket their risk categories amongst their assets. And it's not our job to tell any individual person how to do that because we're not financial advisors. But for us, you know, we each know how much of our portfolio we want to bucket for 
as a risk asset, as a real risk asset, is what we, we I call it my old book. Remember the big money account? It's other other big people's money, money yeah. If you don't have a big money account, meaning a, an account that's designed to take on risk, and there could be fifty dollars in that account, it could be a hundred bucks in that account, or there could be ten million. I don't know, but that account for us is the account that we are willing to take leverage with. We're li willing to take big risks with. Uh, Jordan, I want you to talk. You you said something really interesting. I think a lot of our viewers think of you as, oh, you're the conservative guy. But the reality is they just don't see your risk bucket. Why don't you explain what your risk bucket is? Because it's pretty darn risky. Um, it's just different, right? <laughs> right. So, I mean, I take all my risk in startup investing. And we all take a lot of risk in startup investing. But that's what I view as my risk capital. And then I take about 80% of everything else and put it in the stock market. And that's just like, you know, conservative, nice uh, stock investing. Um, nothing rocket science, and then I like to keep some cash around just in case there is a big pullback so I don't have to sell anything if I do need money for some reason. I, and I, and think, I that, think that, go ahead. I, I, yeah, I think that, you know, that we're all kind of like that. You know, I basically am very risky with all of these startup investments. We know that most startup, you know, startup companies don't succeed. The ones that do really need to hit it out of the park to just bring up our average. Um, and, we, you know, we're looking for a few of those to really hit big to be kind of the, the accelerators in our portfolio. And for me, the stock market is is kind of the safer ground and I'm not as you know leveraged in the stock market from time to time I use uh, margin um, but it's it's very different and I made a whole video about that uh, over on hey there Dave here that kind of goes into my thought on margin and the and the reasons I use it and the reasons I don't use it um, but I think of my stock investing is my, as my kind of more neutral but I for, for me I need a little nest egg, you know, I'm going, I, I'll be risky with stock investments as long as I know that there's maybe 2 million left, right? I, fi I figure <laughs> as long as I can get back to, like losing it all for me would be having $2 million. And I had other people asking me in comments and direct messages, like, at what point did you feel comfortable, like leaving your day job, you know, paying, you know, getting, getting paid to work and now just investing my own money to be my job. Um, and for me, that I think is kind of $2 million. Like that's, that is zero to me. And if I, if I go below that, there's a problem. Yeah. Oh, see, I'm different. I like, if I don't have like maybe three or four times that I would not be comfortable not having a job. But that, see, that, it took me that, for, it took me longer to get to that, uh, 2 million than it did yeah. for you. But but but, but right. that works into your personality, and you know, listen, I, I think you've always been that way, Jordan. You've always you, you you're <laughs> you, you think deeply about this subject every day. Risk is something that you, that is deeply inbred in your thought process, and I think that's great. I mean, it's great. And the bottom line is, I think the reason why you take more risk with our early stage investments, of which we have many, for most people, you guys might not realize that. Me, Dave, and Jordan, uh, it's hard to prove this, but we believe we are the second most active early stage investor in the state of Texas last year, meaning we made more direct investments in early stage companies uh, than almost anyone else in the state, you know, minus, I'm not counting Mark Cuban, and I don't know how many investments he's made. Uh, I, I just don't know that number, but, you know, Capital Factory, who we work with closely as a fund, has made more than us. Uh, but I think other than Capital Factory, I think we're the second in the entire state of Texas. So Jordan and Dave, Jordan, specifically you, you have a lot of conviction in your intellectual capital and your ability to make smart decisions with direct investments into early stage companies in tech. And I think that's why you're willing to take more risk because you're, you're risk, taking a risk on yourself. I happen to have more conviction, and I take a lot of risk in early stage, but I have, I have more conviction in my uh, public investments, in my trading, than I do on early stage investing. And I think, Dave, you probably, like you said, you sit in the middle of both of us. The market's a, new, it's a neutral account for you, your public investments. For Jordan, it's his conservative thing. For me, it's my risky thing, right? So it's so weird how different the three of us are just across the spectrum exactly. in every way. And that's why one size doesn't fit all. And I think that it is valuable for us to share our personal experiences and hopefully everyone watching kind of 
gets that, right? And it's it's not about here's exactly how, here's step one to being a billionaire, right? There's yeah. there's no step one. Yeah. It's all about learning and figuring out what works for you and where your strengths are. And um, it's it that's what it really comes down to. Can, can we now just talk a little bit about debt and leverage in general? Because this is a com this is a topic that I'm so passionate about. I think it's so interesting. If I were to go around and kind of want to educate the world on, you know, how to make it big, right, financially, right, no matter who you are, um, one of the things that I would focus on is, uh, you know, le leverage, leverage and debt. So, you know, when you do feel like you have a, an expertise in a subject area, whatever that area is. For me, I think it's trading. You know, for you guys, it's you know early stage. Um, I think if it, for a lot of people, it's real estate. By the way, right? For a lot of people, it's flipping homes, it's buying real estate, managing real estate. Um, for some other people, it could be their small business. Okay, uh, it could be any. It could be anything. So if you look back in time uh, at, at people that have really made it big, you'll notice the one thing that they were willing to do often, not all the time, but often was kind of take on leverage, leverage their ideas, leverage their expertise, right? And if you think of the entire world capital system as a pyramid, the people at the bottom of the pyramid um, don't know what to do with their excess money, right? So if they have any excess money, it's just sitting in a bank account, right? It's just sitting there and they get maybe these days a tenth of one percent interest. I don't even know what it is. Maybe nothing, uh, and they're happy with that because they don't know how to make more than one tenth of one percent. And the bank is just barely smarter than that, right? So the bank, the bank takes that money, and the bank is really conservative for a lot of reasons. Part of them are regulatory reasons, and the bank will take that money, and then they'll, they will lend that money out, right? They'll lend that money out to people that can borrow that money and actually do something better with it. So, so the bank is taking your money and, and paying you a tiny interest rate. Then other people are taking mo that same money from the bank and paying the bank a higher interest rate, but they don't care. Maybe they're paying the bank 3%, 4%, 5%, 6%. They don't care because they have absolute confidence that over the long term, right, over the long term, they could generate something beyond that in terms of returns for themselves, maybe seven, eight, nine, ten percent, eleven percent. For me, it's been, I know it sounds insane. It's like what, 64.8 percent over the past 15 years averaged out annually. Um, so if you look at that pyramid, it's almost like to a certain extent, unless you have a, a black swan of all black swan scenarios for whatever you do. So the, the real estate black swan might be right now, maybe for commercial real estate. I don't even know. It looks like they'll probably end up surviving. Uh, a stock market black swan would be would be a crash. But as long as you could kind of make it through that event, it's really hard. Dave, would you agree it's really hard to find situations over the past 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years when you would not have more than likely benefited from leveraging in that expertise, just just leveraging in 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 the world's growth, right? Whatever that growth is, growth of business, growth of public markets, growth of early stage. Um, and so it's so funny because the concept of leveraging was so ingrained in my head from an early age. And it was because I read a lot of investment books. And you're ready for this, guys? Not apolitical, apolitical. I, I read Donald Trump's book, uh, his books, when I was a kid, when I was a little kid. And it was fascinating to me, kind of watching guys like Donald Trump in real estate. What I real estate about, what I realized and learned about the real estate world is not all those guys are even smart. A lot of times it doesn't matter what on earth they're doing. They could be doing pretty much anything. They could be buying real estate anywhere. It's not that they picked the right corner mall. It's not that they picked the right piece of land or the right the right office building. It almost doesn't matter what they do because as long as they're borrowing money and they're leveraged, over the long run, as long as they could make it through those black swan scenarios, and Donald Trump almost didn't twice, but when he, he always came back, right? The leverage, it just makes the money for you, yeah, and it and it and Dave, I know you feel this way, kind of as well. What your crazy ETFs that you do sometimes, yeah. levered ETFs. But this is not. But one thing is to understand: we're talking about this. This is how we think about our high risk bucket, right? So we have high risk buckets, whether they're in a separate account or a part of our own account. 
we are fu- we know that there's a risk of an event that will wipe that bucket away. And we've made the conscious decision that we are willing to roll the dice with our high risk bucket that that black swan of black swan events that that we miscalculated and can't get out of quick enough that we're willing to risk that small bit for the 98% chance that we think over the 20 30 year period having a high risk bucket that's levered mm-hmm. is going to generate excess returns for us and so far right guys over the last couple decades like anyone else that's done this it's worked out really well yeah. cuz you can't generate Guys, come on, let's be honest. I can't. It's very hard to generate 65% annualized returns over 15 years when you're talking about eight figure, seven, eight figure accounts um, without leverage. No, but generally speaking, real estate kind of forces you into leverage, right? Because people, yes. I mean, that's the default way of buying property is by making a down payment and having way more expense than you can actually pay for with cash. And to me, that's kind of all margin is. It's basically letting you buy more stocks than you can buy with cash. And so for me, I try to stay fully invested. All of my m- money, instead of having my money sit in a bank account the way Jordan has money sit in a bank account, my bank account money is in the stock market and not all in crazy things that I think are going to you know, be the big movers. But um, I, I just think that you know, and you've seen studies that if you're not fully invested at all times, you you underperform trying to time the market getting in and out. Just on average, that's that's how you know the markets tend to go up. The same way, real estate over time tends to be more valuable, you know, 20 years from now than it was 20 years ago, right? And so, using leverage to accelerate that for stocks or real estate is is the way I look at it. Yeah, and I'm mentally prepared, and I've always said this, I'm always mentally prepared to take a 70% haircut on my total portfolio, right? And I think, I always ask people, like, people like, hey, you know, Chris, can you, I want to do my account just like you do it and stuff. I'm like, okay, so just let me ask, and this is, I would never even say this to a person that wasn't a family member or a close friend or, you know, someone I've known for many, many years, because I'm not a financial advisor and I don't help anyone, you know, outside of my own little, tiny little network. But I'm like, are you prepared to lose 70% uh, of, of that portfolio? And like, and I don't, yeah. I'm not joking when I say that. I mean, like legit, and this is even without margin, right? Like without margin, as soon as you start applying margin, you could be looking at a 90% situation feasibly, right? Like it's, you can, you can hit a hundred percent loss when you're talking about, talking about how much margin you're talking about. So are you willing to do that? And not very often do people come back to me and say, yeah, yeah I'm cool with losing 70%. And, and what I say is, well, well, is there a piece of that money that you would be willing to lose 70% of? And they're usually like, yeah, yeah, there's a piece of the money, there's a piece of money that I could put in an account that I'd be okay losing 70%. I'd be like, okay, then let's start, let's start with that. Because I, I you know, and in the book, I always talk about uh, my old book, Laughing at Wall Street, I talk about, you know, Dave, other people's money, o- OPM. Mm-hmm. And I feel like, I was using that term in a financial sense before anyone else. And now people are using it, right? Yep. But what I mean by that, what I meant by that was trying to, a lot of people can't live with money they make from their job, losing it ever for any reason. And I understand that. So why not just put money in an account that you earned through making sacrifices in your life or trade-offs like clipping coupons or uh, you know, maybe getting your mowing your own yard or buying less coffee. Like there's a billion YouTube channels about this, right? The, the difference is most people have no interest in doing that stuff because the savings are so tiny. You have to wait like 30, 40 years to see anything. And I'm like, well, no, think about, think about every dollar is a hundred dollars. Right. And because listen, I grew my account hundred X over three years when I turned 20 K into 2 million. So, uh, the 20 K, the 80 K that was in my account, the 2 million and, and, that I think of every dollar as a hundred dollars. Now all of a sudden, well, I'll, I'll mow my lawn. I'll save you know twenty five bucks a week, but it's actually twenty five hundred a week uh, if I'm successful in this high risk account. And so you still if, think if, you that know, way? You you we give you a hard time because you won't upgrade the TV in your media room at your house, but you still think, well, if I were to buy a thousand dollar TV right now, that's a hundred thousand dollar TV. I mean. Why would I yeah. do that? Why would I spend $100,000 to have a slightly better image in my media room? And and yeah. it's just ingrained in the way you think and the way you behave. And 
I mean, Jordan too. Jordan won't buy Netflix because... Oh no, I bought Netflix last night. I yes. subscribed. I yes, bought... we did it. Queen's Gambit did it for you, didn't it? Yeah, I did. And I started it. It's a great show, by the way. But yeah, no, I don't really like... I don't buy new cars all the time. I mow my own yard. Um, we've got an espresso machine so that I don't have to buy Starbucks because um, that pays for itself over time. But yeah, I, I, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty conscious about all those things. Let's be honest. The three of us for whatever reason, and we're ridiculously frugal in our own ways. Like, yeah, I, I'm on my, my car seven years old, and it's almost close to seven years old, and realistically, I'm realizing I might not get my Bronco or 2022 now. So my car will be like eight and a half years old, right? And obviously, for those of y'all that watch this show, you know that I can have a nicer car than an eight and a half year old. It's kind of turned into a beater the way I drive it, quite honestly. But um, it did it, like it, the it, day, you know, the within a month of you owning it, it was, uh, you know, scratched up sides and it was, yeah. Yeah. yeah but, and you know, Dave, when Dave knew me in, in LA, like I drove a Ford Exploder. Is what we, we used to call it the Ford Exploder because one day it just kind of the transmission <laughs> dropped out the bottom. But I had wind, so none of my windows worked, right? So like they had power windows that didn't work. So I actually had one of the windows fell down halfway. Do you remember, Dave, we had that silver tape yes. when it got cold? You had to push you, from both sides. You had to push the window up so that it would like actually close and then silver tape it closed yeah. So, yeah. so that you wouldn't have wind noise. And there was still wind noise. Trust me, that, that thing had more holes in it than... That was that was our life, you know. And at the time, I was making exactly three hundred and seventy-five dollars a week with no health insurance. And as you all know, uh, you know, I don't think a lot of people on the show do know. I got sick um, towards the end of my days living in LA. I got very, very sick, um, and I thought I was dying. And it turns out that I kind of was dying. I, I got diagnosed uh, with something called Graves' disease, and I had to have my thyroid nuked. And it was I lost all. I, I got up one morning from my bed and started shaking, I had lost all the muscles in my legs and I collapsed onto the floor. I couldn't get up off the floor because all the muscles in my legs were gone because my heart rate had been going at, I don't know, 180 while I was sleeping, 190 while I was sleeping for three weeks straight, right? And I, if I put my arms out, I would shake like this. But listen, we still have that in our head, the, these moments when we don't have any money to pay our rent we are our cars. So my car has a window taped shut. Um, it's ingrained in us, but everybody has a different way of thinking about what it would take to have risk capital in an account. And I never wanted to find what that is. All I wanted to find is honestly, it's money you're willing to lose pretty much all of it, right? So, like, <laughs> you lose all of it. And so, we all have that inside of our accounts, and we choose to do different things. For me, I choose to lever. Uh, the money in my risk account. Not always, but usually. And sometimes when I have pretty good conviction in in, in, in an individual stock, or in this case, the market in general, not high, but you know, pretty good conviction, for a short period of time, I, I think the risk reward of having more leverage rather than less is worth it for me. And I've been increasing my leverage over the past few months. Uh, I'm at actually, Dave, nine, almost 19. I just checked. $18.9 million is what I'm borrowing from Ameritrade right now on top of my portfolio. And why did I do that? I did that because just for the next few days to few weeks, and I don't know how long it's going to last, I feel like we are going to get a stimulus done. I think that will be positive. I think that will have impacts on you know numerous sectors. I am really jazzed on our um, you know, call it bounce back recovery trade portfolio, which now I have like, you know, $6 million in that portfolio. And I didn't want to sell a lot of the other stocks in our portfolio that I still really like. And the only way to be able to add new positions that I think are great positions, whether, you know, the recovery trades that we've talked about so much, the Amazon trade, uh, that I'm not high conviction in, but the short-term Amazon trade we talked about on yesterday's show, I have we have what almost twelve million dollars in Amazon, right between us. The only way to do that is for me to borrow money because guys, <laughs> the money has to come from somewhere, right? And I made a conscious decision that I'm willing to live with the risk of borrowing that money for these specific trades for a period of time. Now I can pull back on that. Remember when I went in really heavy, guys, and I borrowed what twenty-two million. 
Yeah. I was I was up to twenty two million on the bounce back trade, and it didn't go my way a day later. And I you immediately paired your losses right there. You got out like half yeah. of what you had uh, done the day before. You covered because yeah. you you couldn't my, my, you couldn't thesis. you couldn't justify the interest and losing money at the same time because margin accelerates your losses. Yes, I I exactly. Um, and let's talk about interest in a minute. But I I can't if 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 my thesis and I have a thesis in my head. And if the thesis starts to go wrong in, in a significant way, um, that means that I did something wrong. Uh, and at that point, I start to doubt, you know, the thesis overall. So I, depending on why it's going wrong, right? So the last time was I thought people were ready to move forward with the bounce back trade, and they weren't. Unfortunately, they were two days later. So so I passed <laughs> my trade. I, ha I halfed out of my trade, and two days later, the world was thinking what I was thinking, and then they all started to go up. I was like, oh, now I'm not complaining because I still had half the trade, and it's massive, and it's done so well for us. Dave, it ended up being – it's already one of our top 10 trades of the year, and we've only been in it for a month, right? That's right. That's right. But what are we up like? I don't know. Some crazy amount. Millions in that it trade, was, right? It was more, like, yeah, it was more than $2 million. Yeah. So um, – I'd have to pull it up. But, you know, as the – I had this quote in my book I wish I could remember is a Russian quote and it's kind of like it's kind of like their version of no risk no re uh, no reward but they're like he who doesn't risk will not drink champagne or something like that and it's you know honestly this concept has gone back through uh, all of history right all of history it reward doesn't generally come without risk there are exceptions to that rule but that's the rule right so we have a very defined objective. Like we each have different objectives, right? And we've talked about this on the show. If my objective was in, was uh, wealth preservation, which it is for so many people, I don't think there would be any reason for me to take on margin at all, right? There's no re is there any reason to take on margin if wealth preservation uh, is your objective? Probably not. Um, no, no, that, absolutely not. Because it's the opposite of preserving wealth. It is accelerating the ability for you to lose money, but also make money, right? It's 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 your risk and reward right there. Yeah, but for me, the objective, my objective, my personal objective for my risk account is to massively grow it as large as possible um, so that I can open up opportunities for other people. I mean, we have, you know, we're kind of crazy. We have, me specifically, I have really big big goals and, and those goals are generally all philanthropic in nature right obviously i have goals for my family which i'm close to achieving now but i have really big goals for you know being able to help other people you know my passion is pediatric causes we started my family started a foundation this year the camilla foundation and we are going to spend the next 20 years diving really deep into pediatric causes to see where we can make a really big impact. And in my head, I had this crazy idea that I'm going to grow that foundation to a billion dollars, right? And then maybe I'm insane. But I, you know, the only way that I'm going to even have a chance of doing that is to develop expertise, work on my expertise, build out this community that we have, this amazing Discord community, and have this collaborative idea sharing community to where we can continue to pick winning trades over the next 10 years and then to leverage, to really go all in on those trades and to leverage those ideas in the market and to take big risk on behalf of that foundation. Um, you know, it's not easy growing a few million into a billion, but I think I can do it. And I know you guys kind of have different but kind of similar goals and that you, you're kind of also very philanthropic minded. We're all in a different place in life. Um, but I think we all want to get to a place we've been so fortunate, maybe a little lucky, right? And and we want to be able to do something really big for other people. And that's that's my goal. That's my objective. And so I need to have massive amounts of leverage to do that. And, you know, part of the reason I you know, some people give me a hard time, like I'm looking at this this thumbnail today. I borrowed 18 million to do this. Like that's kind of. That's kind of, it's my big face out there. Ne uh, three years ago, I would have never have said that I would want my face associated with a thumbnail like that. But but at some point along the line, you know, I made a conscious decision that, 
There's no way that we're going to inspire tens of millions to hundreds of millions of people to start investing like us, right? To start getting engaged with money and investing and educating themselves to be able to become, to have that financial flexibility in their life that's not tied to their profession. There's no way we're going to do that by just sitting around and not talking about how well we're doing in, in, our, in our own investments, right? And so we do this stuff. I put myself out there. We put ourselves out there, and it's uncomfortable. It's super, super uncomfortable, right? Like I almost like it's cringy sometimes. But I think I mean, that that, I that photo, I, I will say that you didn't know that I was going to take that out of context from yesterday's show and uh, I love it. Not, not the best facial expression. That was my gift to you, Chris. Yeah, that, well, you, thank you, Dave. Thank you, Dave. But, but <laughs> I, I think, listen, it's cringy for us. It's hard sometimes. But, you know, every time I see something like that and I get a little bit of cringe, I think I remember why I'm doing it. I remember that we need a massive community and we need to keep this going. And and by the way, the larger our channel gets, people don't realize this, the more notoriety and credibility we get, uh, the more access we get to deal flow, whether it's pre-IPO companies or whether it's early stage ventures because people know us, they watch a show, maybe you know we have a better in with a certain founder or a certain venture capital firm. So you know, for us, this is really strategic. We have defined goals and growing this channel and our credibility and kind of airing how well we're doing with what we feel is expertise that we spent a tremendous amount of you know time in our lives developing helps us get there. So Listen, yes, I'm borrowing 18 million. I do have a thesis behind it. I have a reason for it. I have an objective, okay? I understand the risk involved. And it could backfire on me, but I understand the risk. I fully understand it because I've been there. Remember, Dave? We were there and lost it all in our early 20s. I did. Well, and um, for full transparency, I also right now am in margin. And I was just pulling up to see exactly how much. It's $1.353 million, which for me is... That's that's a lot of risk for me, right? I I normally don't sit with that kind of margin, just letting it sit. But like I said, I want to be fully invested in this market anyway. And there was a million and a half dollars worth of additional stocks I wanted to add on top of what I'm currently doing. And I still have room. It looks like I'm at an 86% equity. Per I have plenty of room to go more in margin when more opportunities come up. But these are shorter term opportunities. Not, I'm not just doubling up my entire portfolio saying, well, this is, this is what I'm going to just stay in. I'm going to pay this interest and, uh, you know, try to double, double dip the market. Yeah, I'm really comfortable being in margin, like in that five to eight million dollar range, right? Like that, that's my comfort zone where I don't have to think about it because I know even in a really, really bad case scenario, I'm looking at a 40% haircut, like instant 40% haircut on my whole portfolio. If like something, you know, something, some geopolitical event happens, market drops 25% overnight, which is certainly possible. And my account's down 40%, right? Because I have that margin. That's something that on a, you know, just an ongoing basis, I've gotten really comfortable with. I'm not comfortable here at 18.9, 18.9, Dave, 18.9. I'm not comfortable. Um, if it was comfortable, but, it would be easy, right? This it, yeah. it takes the difficult decisions for you to get to that billion. Is that your goal? Really? A billion dollars? Uh, yeah. I mean, listen, I obviously have I I interim goals. We've talked about that. Like, it'd be nice to get, you know, and then there's such stupid numbers, by the way. It's like, you know, you get just want to get a nice hundred even million, hundred right? million. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, but the goal, the goal is to, to, to be in a position to really, really make an impact. Right. And, and like, oh, I, by the way, you can make an impact with a thousand dollars or no dollars by giving your time and energy to great things. Here's the difference. Like I can do that, but I'm, there's not everybody is capable of doing what I'm doing in the market, right? So the fact that I think I'm capable of doing it, I have to try, right? Because there's, it's not like anybody can go do this and try to get a billion and, 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 and do it, you know, have it allocated towards, you know, trying to, you know, cure MS or uh, any of the other, God, there's just so many insane ailments and, and, and struggles that the world has that- But I that think that's that, that's what you are best at is multiplying money. And for you to take 
a large chunk of that and put it in a foundation and not only continue managing your own money, but now manage the foundation's money and do the same thing there and ramp that money up and, and get that to the, you know, these crazy multiples of, of where it is now. That's, yeah. I mean, that's, that's what you're going to do for the rest of your life. That is your new job. Yeah. Yeah, but, but listen, people are asking in the comments, they're like, well, what did you know? What do you put it in? And I, I kind of mentioned it, guys. It was uh, two things are driving the bulk of that margin. Uh, one is like a six, six and a half million um, bet on recovery stocks. And we've had at multiple episodes, we had one really big one, I don't know, a week or two ago on our recovery stocks. Definitely watch that if you haven't. Uh, the other one is kind of upping my stake in Amazon quite significantly. And that and that just happened on Friday, and we had an episode about that yesterday. So between those two things, that that ad, that right there adds about uh, about eleven million in margin. So I I kind of previously, you know, like I just said, my my comfort range is kind of like five to eight. So you know, if I take those two p trades off, uh, that kind of brings me down to the. You know the the regular five to eight million in margin, which is something I I can live with. But then the um, other stock you have a lot of is Peloton, right? So if you factor in the top the top end, if you sort by percentage of um, holdings in your Peton's brokerage biggest. account, Peton has Peton. to be your biggest. Well, not anymore, Dave. Amazon is right now. Well, actually, because you've but... you've yeah doubled down on a crazy expensive yeah, stock. Two and a half, double and a half down on Amazon, but. But Peton is really big. And by the way, like I also today, the reason why I'm 18.9, uh, not not 18 from yesterday day, because I bought more Bitcoin today in that in that ETF. So, you know, it, it's 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 stressful. <laughs> <laughs> but um, and let's talk about interest. You you interest called me last night at like midnight. This you you never sleep. No, I don't. And I, I really didn't answer don't. because I was, I was way sleeping. beyond midnight, Dave. That was, I, you know, I'm up till three usually. I call. I don't remember why exactly I called you, but oh, oh, this is why I called you. I, I was going back and forth with Brian, who works with us on the channel, and you know, one of the channel strategies. I, I was kind of watching some of these fin talkers. Is that what they call them? Fin talkers. Uh, uh, fintech or, or money, uh, fin money TikTokers, uh, and these are young kids. And quite honestly, I'm impressed with a few of them. Like I'm really yeah. impressed. Like I, I'm just, I'm just really impressed. And it's not even so much about hey, they're great at picking stocks. It's more about they are insanely good at getting people comfortable with the idea of the market and what things mean and like the underlying principles of, of how to trade stocks, forget about picking stocks. And I really want to get more involved with that community. So I was, I was wanting to talk to you, both you guys, well, now I'll do it on the channel about bringing some of them onto the channel and maybe having them be, I don't know, like semi regular guests. Cause we've been talking for a long time. We have this, we have no diction. We want to do this dictionary segment to where yeah. we explained everything, right? Um, but listen, I, there's it's a lot of us, right? Like that's a lot of us videos on there. Like I don't know if I want to have 500 Dave Jordan and Chris videos on YouTube under this channel. If we went out and found the greatest person who's just so entertaining, and we kind of approved the scripts and how we thought we wanted to explain each subject matter, and just had. Yeah, maybe someone you well, know, a little younger, a little even more. Even some of these examples that that I've been watching, they're really good at like not only explaining things like to uh, to people who have never even thought about certain concepts. You know, they in thirty seconds do what it would take us like ten minutes in a video to explain. So they're better than us. They're just way let's just say they're, 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 they're way 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 better than us. And I think you know we all came from the you know early stage operational startup world that's what we that's what we did for 15 years 20 years of our life and the, it, you don't get in that world very far thinking that you're the best at everything right like you, you get far in that world when you start to recognize the talent around you and you you really uh provide that talent with the resources to thrive right and you give them accountability and i want to start doing the same thing with this channel i there's I didn't have, I'll be honest, I didn't have any, very little respect for anyone even remotely touching the concept of investing in media five years ago. 
Just I don't I didn't yeah. I didn't there was not one person that I saw and said I want to emulate them or I want to partner with them because or it was I the have old a world. Channel. Yeah, it's, that, that was the old way of doing things, and we were not impressed by any of the financial media or the way they were doing things. And that's kind of why we said, let's just bring cameras to our meetings and show people kind of what what really happens. Even even shows that are completely different, like we're, I'm not talking news, talking head, finance news, but like Shark Tank. That's not actually how startup investing is done. I mean, I love it because it brought the idea of you know, starting a company and presenting it to investors to the forefront and people starting to talk about that sort of thing. But that's not reality at all. So that's that's kind of how Dumb Money started was us bringing cameras to our meetings so you could see what a real startup meeting was like. Yeah, and by the way, uh, this is gonna be really cool. I know a lot of you guys haven't um, seen a lot of those videos. We are actually going to, you know, there's going to be a few days over the holidays where we're not going to be doing our live show every day. Okay, it's going to be a few days we're spending time with family, doing holiday stuff, and we need a little bit of a break. But what we are doing instead is we are going to be showing some of our favorite stuff from our early stage investing days and early stage investing episodes. We're going to hand select some of that stuff and show it on this channel because I think a lot of people watch this channel. They don't. They only know us as you know. People that trade, we're traders, right? But the yeah. reality is 50% of what we do is investing in early stage companies. And it's really fun, guys, uh, our episodes. So we're going to show a few of those on this channel. Yeah, I'm looking forward to um, that. Because but yeah, Dave, every so time I go back I and watch one of those, I'm just like, wow, that, that was such a good, I, that was entertaining. I want to watch that again. It, oh, it's it just was. My, it's my favorite thing to do is just go meet with companies, figure out what they're doing, get, get involved, help them solve problems. Like that, to me, is the... You know, I just feel so disconnected from the actual stock market that it's uh, it's way more fun to work with startups. I I get it. I get it. I I love both. I do. I I love I love both. But I also, Jordan, like I'm now working with a few really deeply. Yeah. And I know you are working on a huge project deeply, and it, it's hard when you get spread thin in that world really easily, right? And totally. and there's once you start to dip your foot in the water, what what happens is we have all these founders calling us every day, wanting advice and wanting more money. And it's just, it was taxing, I think. <laughs> uh, so I'm kind of glad that this year we kind of pulled away from it. It, it was, for me, it was, it was beneficial. Um, so yeah, listen, that that's, that's it. So it's a huge margin. Oh, by the way, how much money does it cost? Interest. Let's talk about that. It's not, I'm not paying 7% interest, right? Obviously when you borrow more money, the interest rates come down on margin. And when you borrow a lot of money and you do it regularly over a very long period of time, it gives you the leverage to negotiate margin rates with your broker, which is what I've done. We actually did a whole show about that. I don't think on our original uh, Dumb Money channel, not Dumb Money Live, but uh, I pay guys, I think I pay right around 2% margin, I think is what I'm paying. So, That's you know, it could be a little higher, maybe 2.2, 2.3, 2.1. It's something in that low two range, I think. So, you know, on, on 1.8 million right now, that's what, about 300 and 400,000 a year, roughly. So about 30, what is that, about 33,000 a month, more or less, right? about $1,000 a day in margin. So yeah, I'm paying $1,000 a day in margin. And then, you know, I sometimes I short stocks and I have to pay a little extra for that, but it's $1,000 a day habit. It's a $1,000 a day habit. It's a, not a, That's very not expensive. the worst $1,000 a day habit, is it? <laughs> no, but it's very expensive. That's an it's expensive, expensive cost of money, even at 2%. Yeah. Now, and I don't want to pretend that I'm going to continue to generate 64.8% returns for the next five, 10 years because of the, you know, the more money you have investing, it gets tougher, right? But, you know, what if I did? Like, what just using that term, like this year, I'm up way more than 64.8%, right? I'm in the, I don't know, a few hundred percent. So if you're borrowing money at 2.2%, remember I told you the pyramid? Like, people are giving the bank money and getting a tenth of 1%. Then the bank, or in this case, Ameritrade, right? Uh, they're giving me money at like 2.2%, 2.3%. They're like, man, we love, by the way, 
<laughs> brokers love margin, right? They oh, love sure. it. This is how they make all their money. Like Ameritrade is making, I don't know, almost probably with all my trade flow and everything else, almost half a million dollars this year if I were to continue that margin rate, right? So you ask like, how do brokers make money? How does Robinhood make money? Like this is how they make big money. But I'm okay with that because I'm making even bigger money from out of that because if I could generate even 10%, that's 8%. On 1.8, which is a lot of money, that's like a million and a half dollars that I made by taking risk with other people's money, right? With Ameritrade's money, yeah. which is actually, you know what? Ameritrade's money is your money, guys. It's like, because again, <laughs> the money that you have that you're not using, they give it to me. <laughs> so, uh, so, I don't funny know. funny how that works. That, 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 that's leverage. That's that's margin. Um, and I was, I was looking to see what my rates are because I have not made the call. I'm not in margin frequently enough or long enough to um, have even tried to negotiate it down. Uh, and I'm at Schwab with my primary brokerage and they say uh, for balances over a half a million dollars, call us because they don't even quote it on their website. So I don't even know what I pay. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that's a thing. odd. If you could calculate it, if you've seen the fees come out. Yeah, I need to. Um, well, I don't think I've been in a full month okay. to be able to calculate a, what the APY so, is. Yeah. So, Dave, there is a place to see it. And I can't I couldn't find it. And I called my guy at Ameritrade. And I was like, Joe, hmm. where is my margin rate? Why do you guys hide it? And he's like, Chris, it's over. Just hit click this and this and this. And I was like, I don't know where it is anymore. But I, I, he showed me where it was and it's in there somewhere. But it, it, they don't. They certainly don't make it easy to see, and that's probably because. And this is for every broker. For almost every broker, the margin rates are pretty high for most people, right? Yeah. Um, but well, they show you know, me. There is. A they show me my uh, month-to-date interest owed as a calculation based on the balance uh, subject to interest, which is my that one point three five million that I was talking about. So I could do some math if I figured You're out the beginning the of the month, month and. Yeah, so let me just do some quick math. Continue, carry on as you were. Yeah, so, so you know, <laughs> someone says, you know, someone says the smart money is lending out margin capital. Well, yes. So I always say the smartest money, and I will, I will say this, you know, we we we're surrounded by so many uh, people who are either in real estate, in oil, but who are in more than that, who are in the venture community, in the hedge fund community. The really smart money, if you're really smart, but we're not that smart is the problem. That's what we're called, dumb money. The really smart money is go get really good grades, graduate top of your class from an Ivy League school, and just meet the right people, network, dress really nice. Not like this, right? Like learn how to dress <laughs> uh, to impress. And, and then go start up a fund, right? And we joke about this all the time. All the guys we know with funds, it's funny because they don't lose. They're literally investing other people's money. Like, like they are just investing other people's money. And if they lose, they still win, right? So that is the smartest money. The smartest money is, yes, when you can get other people's money and then you can make money with that or even just, yeah, being a bank, right? Just because the bank has virtually no risk. They're taking money for that small just, interest they're rate. They're just grabbing their fees. They just get their grabbing fees. Grabbing their fees. Yeah, it's a, listen, it's a, it's a sales game, right? It becomes a distribution and sales game. But there's a lot of work in that as well. It's not fun for me. And because that, listen, is that, would that just drive you nuts if you were one of these guys that you're in an industry where it's basically just taking money from here? And and then just lending it out of there, you get the spread. Getting a little spread right? and, and, and yeah. And but your you're constantly life. just trying to make sure your cost of acquiring that money, you know, getting that new customer, getting them to make the deposit. I mean, that's does that sound you're fun? You're just feeding the machine, right, Dave? Yeah. You're feeding the machine. And and then you play a lot of golf and then you <laughs> buy nice things, I guess. Because I think a lot of times people, they buy the, all the nice things because they're their job is so boring. The only stimulation is buying all the nice things and doing all the crazy stuff. Like we are so stimulated by our day job, right? Like we don't need to go get stimulated with all these crazy things afterwards because yeah. we're just like, 
we just want to watch Netflix. And Jordan has a hard time even doing that. <laughs> bucks a month. You've got an easy time now because I've got the account. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. So it looks like uh, I probably should make a phone call because I, my rough calculation is I'm at 6% interest um, annually. But Dave, so, but I mean, but Dave, still. You will, you're on a grid and I guarantee you that grid will go down because everybody's on the grid and it, it tiered system and it just yeah. automatically will take you down to 28293. So, well, I'm, I'm basically their, their grid doesn't, their published grid doesn't go beyond a half a million dollars. And their base rate that the grid is tiered, you know, everything above has a uh, something added to it. Their base rate was 6.5. So it looks like my default may have dropped close to six. It's hard to tell though, because it's the 16th and I'm just basically doing math by doubling the amount I paid this month, dividing that by the amount I uh, have uh, borrowed and then multiplying that by 12. And that is 6%, 6.03%. By the way, Doing Drops so. Family Garden says, but Jordan stocks up on ribs and brisket, LL, not hamburger patties. Here's the problem with that. <laughs> Jordan even beats me there because he's just good at everything. So yes, he can make crazy brisket on his crazy grill. I have to go to Hillstone, Houston's, and pay $38 for ribs that taste you know i think almost as good as his but <laughs> but so no he wins there too guys he wins there too um someone asked if i still own the gap i do still own the gap but i don't want it to come off like oh yeah i i did a i've been keeping an eye on the gap and doing a lot of analysis and i made a conscious decision that it's still a good trade at these levels guys i i'll be the first to admit i'm so overwhelmed this year with how many trades we are in that I know there are mistakes in my portfolio right now. I know there are things in my portfolio that I maybe should get out of. I just haven't had time to kind of loop back in on them. Hopefully over the holidays, I can kind of kind of like take some time, read up on each of these trades that we're in and also catch up with the Discord community. I hear there's a lot of new high conviction reports that I need to look through. Um, by the way, guys, oh, I'll save it for Friday. Um, I did a transaction yesterday with someone from our community for a product, and I don't even want to say what it is, but Friday, we'll talk about that because it's one of the coolest things I've ever done. It's I'm so pumped about this, and I'll show it to you guys on Friday. Uh, wow! Okay. So if you haven't subscribed to this channel, pff, how could with a with a tease like that? Because you're getting good at these like major market teases. <laughs> I'm getting, I'm trying, Dave. I'm trying, <laughs> but I believe in it. I truly believe it's not what you say, it's how you say it. And it, you can't say it unless you really believe it. And I'm telling you guys, this is actually, I don't like nice things. This I like. This I really like. And I can't wait to show it to you guys uh, on, on Friday. So is Vista still a buy at this level? Same thing, guys. I, I, I'm contemplating that same exact question. By the way, Vista, I want to announce, is the very first uh, deposit I made into my charitable foundation this week. I, get, I put all of my Vista stock, uh, I don't know, $600,000 uh, into the foundation. I'm going to be putting a bunch more stocks in the foundation before the end of the year. Does uh, that mean Vista, you're going to liquidate it, Chris? Well, I, I haven't really liquidated it yet. It's it's it. So I haven't like it's in there, and yeah. now I can. And this, here's what's so cool about you know charitable foundation is, I can liquidate it now, and the foundation won't pay any of the gains because it has all big gains in there. You know, three, four, four hundred thousand dollars of gains, and so like, it won't. I won't pay any of the gains on that. And I have other stocks I'm going to do the same thing with. Uh, it's not a massage. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was actually a good, that's a good comment. That would have been great, though. I that massage chair. That's a regular viewer right there. Yeah. I, I want that's it. That's a good guess. <laughs> I want it. It's so funny. There is, uh, Jordan, well, I guess you haven't been anywhere this year, but there are a few of these places around town that you take your kids to now that they're your kids' ages. And they, they're like, these not like a bounce park, but like there's all that crazy stuff. It's like a big warehouse with like just stuff for them to do and a few of them have the chairs there like they all have the massage chairs and you and i'll feed a 20 in the massage chair and i will literally have the greatest oh 40 community minutes of my massage life. Chair? gross i'm out no oh, that's like going to the fine. state fair of texas and and getting Why in the massage chair room 
Gross. Wipe, wipe it down. If you need to. No, thank you. Yeah, you can't wipe uh, that down. You might be able to wipe the COVID off, but you're not going to be able to wipe off dead humanity. Dead skin and ugh. <laughs> I can't believe you, of all people, would sit in a community massage chair. You know why, Dave? I'll tell you why. It's back because you to because you didn't want to go to the uh, whatever snowball fight room or something. No, I mean it's it, <laughs> it's 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 that good. That's why. Like it's it's I'm t if, I, if you have back issues like I have, I I will walk. I will get up from that chair after 30, 40 minutes, and it it's about as good as paying for three four hundred dollar. Massage. That's and you should really treat yourself and buy yourself one for Christmas. I feel like we need. Too bad we don't take sponsors because, like, if we did, <laughs> like, how, you would how be would sitting in one every day. I mean, we would have a massage chair sponsor, and I can deliver the best commercial. They would. You can't pay for the type of commercial I would deliver. I mean, at some point, someone should just send me one of these massage chairs, you know, so I can actually talk about it. I mean, gosh. <laughs> anyway, of course I have to put it in my garage, but what else, guys? Any questions, uh, anyone? Is the market still holding up, guys? Is yeah, it still... it's, you know, it's flattish. Oh, so it's not up. No. Oh, I am up huge. Uh, what is that's, what is it that's today? Good Let me just pull what? up the, uh, so the Dow is, it basically it's unchanged. The Dow is down a quarter of a percent. The uh, NASDAQ is up a quarter of a percent. And the S&P is basically unchanged at 0.06%. Uh, yeah, Peloton hey, is up pretty well. GAN, GAN is up. Airbnb up up 12%. Uh, Bitcoin is up 10, 9.9. Uh, what's PLNHF? What, what am I, is that Planet... 13 or planet whatever. 13 yeah that's yeah that's up eight percent today sweet um all right i got a smile on my face now it's it's, it's a good day uh well, planet looks like it dropped off a little bit there recently so it's uh it's just recovering it's coming back a little bit yeah my best is peloton today um why is someone saying is Robin Hood going out of business? Are people trying to freak us out? Like they know we have. <laughs> oh, there was a thing today. Something happened today. I forgot what it was. Uh, Gosh, could they just being stop it? sued by somebody for? Um, no, not Peloton. Somebody asked if it's Peloton getting sued. I don't know about that, but I think uh, um, Robin Hood uh, getting sued. Robin Hood is facing complaints from the Massachusetts regulators for right. exposing dot dot dot. Hang on. I'm loading the rest of this quote, exposing investors to unnecessary trading risks. Ah, very timely for today's episode. Yeah. Robin Hood faces that... complaint by the Massachusetts Securities Regulator for failing to protect investors in the form of uh, unnecessary trading risk in its platform. According to the Wall Street Journal, regulators enforcement arms said that Robin Hood exposed its investors to trading risk, thereby violating state laws and regulations. Part of the complaint focuses on the company's breach of a new investor protection rule that was implemented three months ago. Robin Hood uh, says that they disagree with those allegations. Wasn't there a I mean, bug in Robin Hood like a while ago that you could get almost infinite leverage? The infinite money loop. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> infinite money glitch where people were able to, with like $1,000, borrow $1,000, and then they had $2,000, so they could then borrow $2,000, and then they had $4,000, and then they could borrow $4,000. The way it's supposed to be calculated is it's based on the initial amount. So right. you can... The regulations, uh, the, the FINRA and the uh, New York Stock Exchange actually regulate it, and you're allowed to have up to four times leverage. Right. So on $1,000, you can get up to $4,000, but you can't then double that to get right. 8000 and that's the problem. That was that was a great bug. Man. Little little glitch that, uh, and, and I feel like because people got into that and were exposed to risk that was outside of what regulators were allowing brokerages to do it, it was almost like a perfect crime for you to as an investor go in and just do that because if you win you just cash out and say i, I did it I, yeah. I, that's it i'm, I'm stepping away i'm walking away from the, lose, uh, the roulette wheel and if you, re well, you lose and say i will I absolutely give the thousand dollars that i lost of my money and i don't know what happened to all that uh money you should not have let me borrow in the first right. place. Um, Dave, we, there's so many good questions. Can we just like, can I rapid fire answers quick of these? 
Uh, Do it. Dumb Money, are you guys in OSW? Yes, I am in OSW, which is one uh, spa holdings or one spa world, whatever. We talked about that on our recovery trade episode. Um, also, people are asking, um, have you researched Palantir? It's not a stock we've looked at yet. Um, people are asking. And why have we not cook? looked at that? Because that is, is one of those hot IPOs that everyone is talking about and has was offered to us in advance and for some reason it's it's just one of those that i never knew enough about to want to do the research because my gut tells me i'm not going to want to be interested in it because based on everything i know about palantir i don't have an issue with the company but i just it's just i've, I've known about it for years and we were you know doing ticker tags in new york for the last six years it was a company that came up all the time i i just i feel people don't really Fully understand it, but I, I don't want to. It's a, it's a lot of work to get into Palantir. I don't want to quite do it yet. We will at some point. Uh, will we consider our putting our healthy cookies on a crowdfunding platform? I think we would maybe consider it, but we're not quite there yet. Um, but we'll talk about that more as we get closer to that point, guys. We've been working on that company for a year. Uh, what else here? Sorry, guys. There's a bunch of really good questions. I'm kind of trying to go back through the list to, to find them. Well, you find one. I'll tell you, I had an unhealthy cookie experience yesterday. I bought the uh, Mariah Carey uh, DoorDash uh, They're pretty delivery good. cookies. They're super uh, sugary. I thought, yeah, I couldn't sleep last night because I, I had my cookies and watched the Mariah Carey special on Apple TV+. Plus, and um, then I was, like, wired for the rest of the night. Man, I, but so they you were did good. That on purpose? Did you order the cookies because you knew that's what you were watching? Yes, absolutely. That was my plan, is to watch that special and have her cookies while I was doing it. That is something that I would never do. <laughs> Ever, both of those things. Either one, I would never do. I would never Chris, watch you watch the special, special, right? And I would never get those cookies. Mar what, the Mariah? Oh, you talking about the Christmas? Yeah, the, the Christmas. New York one? Uh, no, yeah. the, the Christmas. Uh, well, she started in New York, and then her apartment opened up into a winter wonderland. It was right. amazing. Yeah, that's mad for it. me. No, we haven't wa We haven't watched it. I watched the Christmas tree lighting one. I think she was at, was she at that one? Um, no, the, they, yeah. they had a bunch of different artists doing songs there, and they could, the Christmas tree, so the Rockefeller like Christmas tree special has turned into just songs by people that, I didn't really sign up for, but See, I just like watching the old funny movies that uh, that we watch every year. Snoop Dogg made an appearance in the uh, Mariah Carey special. That was nice. Was, was it worth watching? That's all I need to know. Was it worth watching? I enjoyed it. It, it I mean, it's obviously cheesy. It's holiday fill, but they had they had uh, peanuts. You know, Apple TV Plus has uh, the uh, Christmas special from Peanuts, and so that integrated into it. It it was I like I liked it, but I love Christmas stuff. I've watched four Christmases this year. I've watched. Oh, uh, well, we saw a good one. Oh, we're only halfway done with it. Uh, it's actually pretty okay. I don't want to even say good, it, but for <laughs> like a stupid Netflix. Uh, it's Holiday. Have you seen Holiday yet? No, but that's on my list. And the Disney Plus one uh, with uh, Kendrick. What's her name? Um, yeah, uh, Holiday. Holi uh, or what's it? Anna Kendrick. Care. Anna Kendrick, yes. Her Did you know that there's Christmas a movie. Mel Gibson really movie out where he's Santa Claus and like people are coming after him with guns? It's yes. Like, it's it's like called The Fat Man. I watched the trailer for that. <laughs> it looks it I'll, looks ridiculous. I'll I couldn't even believe that was a sure. thing. <laughs> I'll, I'll watch that for sure. Um, guys, uh, hold on. And, you know, I'm looking at these other Did you not find... I, I was vamping while you could try to find a question to answer I'm, I'm looking for your questions guys on, on on stocks i just there were a lot of them and i'm now i lost a uh, helion uh I, I i really dramatically lowered my position in helion a little while ago i still have some shares uh yeah i did some I research just, on hylion yesterday hylion. just to kind of get the lay of the land it doesn't sa it sounds like most of their pre-orders are like i don't want to you know like a company related to them somehow and then also Wait, Lord's, uh, not lordstown lordstown uh, yeah i think so and then um the other issue is that basically the only reason like one of their biggest sell selling points is um you know you get you can if you use it with a certain type of um, pro the natural gas you can get credits the problem is there's not enough of that natural gas around for them to roll it out and enough companies be able to get those credits for it to be worthwhile. And so, you know, there's just not, it's one of the, I feel like with this one, it's like a wait and see thing and see how their orders actually go um, and see how they're actually installing. And then are they getting reorders? So it's going to take some time for this one to shake out. 
I, I have a like small it. position, and I haven't, I haven't, I didn't even do what you did, Jordan, um, yeah. on them. I kind of a lot of these guys, a lot of these um, uh, kind of the EV plays, and also the um, hydrogen plays. I kind of just, I knew I was going to be in them for a while because I didn't think anything was going to change yeah. overnight. A plug, plug power is doing insane. That's my biggest position by far out of all these, and it's just, it's really, really looking good. Uh, so I can't really comment too much, but but highly in or however you spell highly it. on. I actually, I mean, I love their concept. I just think, I just don't think the ROI is there for the power plant that they're putting out right now. But once they can figure out how to get, um, what is it, the uh, hydrogen fuel cell power plant, then maybe that's a, you know, a better, um, you know, a better pitch. We'll just have yeah. to see. We have not. We have I not. Keep an eye on them, though. But I love the concept. But they're another we one of these not, companies that don't do anything, right? So they don't actually yeah. do the conversions. They don't actually make anything. They're like a, you know, they just they came up with the concept and they're running the organization, putting the putting the pieces together. Yeah, they're just putting um, the pieces together. Uh, PaySafe is not a company I know anything about. I'll, I'll I'll look into it, guys. But I don't know anything about PaySafe. Uh, let's see. I think we're getting to most of these questions. I'm uh, MM here. EDF, that that mind med. We talked so about that. So that's an interesting one, Dave. I part of me feels like, you know, I was in that trade because I felt like it would capture the attention of a lot of the newbie investors at some point, and then it would really rock it. And so, like, I didn't think it was going to happen the week after our show. So like now that it's happened so quickly, did it start? Did how much did it drop now? We're down to okay. three forty-seven. So now, oh, so it's dropped pretty a lot since it's hitting what hit five. But well, yeah, I was not anticipating that that was a company I was going to be in and out of in a week, right? Two weeks. So I, I just haven't. I don't have an opinion on them. I it's not a valuation play, right? This was a social arb play based on a media cycle. Uh, not based on real value, but based on a media cycle that I knew at some point would start to accelerate for these psychedelic companies. I, I'm now I'm a little, I'm a little weirded out that it happened this quickly, quite honestly, and I don't really know what to do. So for the moment, I still have that stock. I'm not selling it. Uh, Tattooed Chef, guys, I am not into it. I'm not against it. I just didn't, it doesn't look like they have enough distribution. I looked into the reviews. I looked into the social mentions of Tattooed Chef, uh, the search traffic. I'm just not seeing enough to feel comfortable that this is a slam dunk brand. Is Tattooed yeah. Chef another one of these like Hello Fresh type things? No, no, no. Tattooed Chef, Jordan, they sell products at like Sam's Club. They sell like frozen cauliflower rice product base dishes yeah. and stuff. Oh, we, we probably buy that. Maybe. You know what's interesting? Uh, my wife came to me and told me, you know that egg company that we were invested in and I had to sell them, by the way, yeah. uh, Vital Farms. because I, I love need Vital Farms, the company. I hate Vital Farms, the stock. Well, I, I, I'm at, I'm been out of the stock for some yeah. time now, but my wife told me that she started buying their little egg, like the little container the thing. Is it the sandwiches? Or like, I think it's the hard-boiled eggs or something like that, pre-done okay. or I don't. No, not hard-boiled eggs. Excuse me. They're like scrambled egg patties that you microwave with like stuff in them, like ham and just stuff inside of them. And she said they're pretty incredible, which is was shocking to hear. So I don't know. I'm gonna keep an eye on Vital Farms. If if you know if that thing if those products pick up traction, that's a game changer for them because Vital Farms. It's one thing to sell a bunch of eggs. It's another thing to have a consumer packaged product, egg product, that's really starting yeah. to catch wind. Where I would well, you imagine... get better margins on that stuff. I mean, their eggs are so expensive, but I'm sure it's just an expensive business to be in. We buy, I buy their eggs, but uh... so the bites, that's what they are, the bites, yeah. Dave. And they, I know they sell them at Starbucks, but I just assume they. I mean, I've read some reviews, and people do like them, but. For her to come say that to me means that I don't know. I'm gonna I'm gonna now look into it again. And yeah. another stock I am. Where does she get those at? at? Where do you, where do you buy those at? I don't know. I'll I'll find out for I you. Feel, I feel like I've seen this packaging for eggs in our kitchen, but uh, I wouldn't have even told you what brand it was. That's interesting. Hey guys, I'm gonna make a trade right now. By the way, um, 
Oh. We need a uh, we need a graphic for like when you do a trade, like boom, 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 trade time. I mean, you keep me on the show long enough. I'm Did buying, you buy for Amazon? No. Um. Here's the thing. I I was talking trade alert. To do, 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 do. Trade alert. Yeah. I'm gonna make one. Don't worry. I was talking to Patrick about this yesterday. Actually, what's your um, trade, man? You see, here's the problem. I'm making this trade, and I hate these. E- I, these market makers, man, they just they just abuse you. You know, they just abuse you, and they won't let you get your stupid order in. All right, it's in. I don't care. I'm not paying more for it. What's your uh, trade? I'm, I just bought some. I bought ten thousand shares of Funko just now, because not because my Funko research is 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 done. It's not even close to being done. It's something I want to watch over the next thirty days. I just feel like they have these potential opportunities. We talked about this. The Funko Pop that you can make in your own image that's being tested right now in LA yep. is a really big deal. Um, it sells for like 50 bucks and the earliest reviews I was able to find are actually pretty impressive. So imagine having a Funko pop of like you, Jordan, or you, Dave, or Wait, like so what whatever. what prompted you to make this trade right now? So I, I've been researching them for the past week because a couple members of our community have surfaced this. Uh, so, it, it, listen, thank you, community, for kind of resurfacing something that's happening. But also, on top of that, what's really exciting is, you know, Shopkins, right? Like the Shopkins trend that we traded like years ago on Five Below. Well, Funko is basically coming out with their own version of Shopkins, and they call them, I think, Snappables. So they're like, they come in a little egg deal, and they snap together. So you can put like a horse head onto a cow body and put like a human behind on it like 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 just and you like they snap together so it's a brand new product they just released it in a target exclusive at target right so i haven't seen enough to say hey this is a hot product on either of those products but i think both of them have the potential to be game changers for Funko. So just the mere fact that they have two different potential game changers, I wanna open up a small base position in Funko, if there's nothing else to remind me to continue researching it when I see it in my portfolio every day. You do that. You, you basically make a 10,000 share trade just as a little place mark <laughs> for, maybe I should remember this ticker. Yeah. You're the only person I know who does something like that. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> I actually do the deal. same thing, but with much smaller. <sighs> so anyway, I, I just bought some Funko. Uh, listen, I, 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 I'm going to watch this so closely, guys, over the next month, because if they're able to have a runaway hit with these snappable products or with the custom, you know, Funko Pop sell for like, what do they sell for, Jordan? 12 bucks normally? Eight, I have, nine, ten, boy, I've never bought a they're Funko They're so Pop. cheap. They're so cheap. But now yeah, they have a Funko Pop that costs 50 bucks. Uh, granted, I'm sure it's way more expensive to manufacture. But still, I bet the margins are pretty good on it. And Yeah, but they're not going to be making, you can't make the individualized ones at scale like that, can you? I, I was just looking, and it looks like, I, you know, if you try to go in and build a Funko that looks like you, and this obviously isn't me building me because I put a uh, funny mustache on it because, you know, why not? Um, but it looks like they just give you, you know, things like a pick and choose colors and, and things for, uh, you know. No, that's not. So it's like a bitmoji? It's, it's basically, it's called a pop yourself. Is this not yeah. what you're talking about, Chris? Yeah, but I, I, um. Like if I wanted to build a Chris with a, you know, remember we had that funny mustache earlier this year? Well, it will put you in a t-shirt because that's all you ever wear. And then we're going to give you headphones because, you know, why not? Uh, <laughs> and, oh, background. You didn't have the that mustache for a while. I did have the mustache for a while. But then what happens? Is this, is this just creating a, uh, well, I'm, I thought I might be able to buy one of these. Is this just uh, creating a Bitmoji basically? No, they're not available for you yet, Dave. They're only doing it. And I thought they had a machine. I thought I could be wrong. I thought they had a machine that lets you that basically creates an image of you based on a uh, photograph. So that, maybe this I is, think that would be too difficult. You'd have to have a designer then take that or artificial intelligence, like figure out which features to accentuate and turn it into a weird Funko head. It has to be more like this. You go pick the parts that look like you and then they yeah, pop one out. Um, 
Let's see here. Yeah, it's a million unique combinations. You're right, million unique combinations. But again, the early heat of it is really cool. Kind of the same way when Nike released their, uh, you know, design your own Air Force Ones, right? Remember that yeah. or whatever they were? You, you design your own uh, Nikes. It brought should, a lot. We of... should uh, we should put this in the uh, dumb money store because we'll just call that the Chris. <laughs> oh gosh. Oh man. Oh. So 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 we'll see. I like I said, this is this is by no means what I consider a fun Funko a buy right now. By no means. I'm just something to look at, something to follow and just keep an eye, especially on these snap I think they call them snappables. Um do you remember when, when Shopkins were out, I was like, dude, if we could invest directly in Shopkins, we would be billionaires because that was the most obvious trade I had ever come across. And unfortunately, it was just no way to trade directly in that in that foreign private company. Yeah. So, Dave, uh, we've already gone 30 minutes past our allotment here. We're an hour and a half in. We've got to end this. Wow. Time flies when you're having fun. Thank you guys so much for watching. We are don't know. Are you, are you really ready to end it? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, let, let, let's do it, because I have not been in Discord in a week, and every day I say I'm going to get in Discord and kind of catch up, and I would really would like to do some of that today. All right, well, if you aren't a member of our Discord, you can go to dumbmoney.tv slash Discord, get an invite. These are a few of our uh, leading uh, contributors to the uh, Discord community right now. If you want to see your name on the list, join up. It's free, it's fun, it's, uh, it's I, I just go in and, and like to read what's going on. We have a great community of people uh, doing all sorts of things. Uh, we also have a uh, merch store. If we, uh, do I have a button for that? Yes. Um, if you want something with our stupid faces on it, this is the place to go, dominie.tv slash merch. We are on all the places. You could follow us on Twitter and Instagram and uh, I believe even TikTok. Maybe one of these days you'll see us do a funny dance or collab with someone who can dance better than us. Thanks so much for watching Weird Dumb Money. We will see you here tomorrow. Mm.